electron transport chain is going to be the time that we are actually um, getting that potential energy, turning the, con the, the potential energy from NADH and FADH into uh, the con like a, a truer, a more true representation of energy with ATP, right? Up until now, up until the electron transport chain, realistically, NADH and FADH haven't done anything. They've just served as like a purse for electrons and hydrogens. They haven't actually uh, gotten anything out. They haven't actually paid any money yet. It's just been a fancy purse with nothing else going on with it. Um, here, I can go ahead and pull up the PowerPoint so that it's actually making sense. This is going to be a good schematic representation of what... Um, what electron transport chain really looks like. So if you actually just consider NADH and FADH as all that they are, which is hydrogen and electron transporters that are moving from one part of a or one part of a cell into the mitochondria and into this section of the mitochondria, which is right in between the layers of membranes of the mitochondria, all they're doing is dropping off electrons and dropping off hydrogens. That's it. They're shuttling. They're they're Amazon delivery guys, right? Like they're they're truck drivers. They're however you want to think about it. All they're doing is picking up a package and dropping off a package. That package is high energy electrons and positively charged hydrogen ions. So what happens with the electron transport chain is there is a series of um, kind of like three pumps, if you will, that pump hydrogen ions out of the inner matrix of the mitochondria and into the intermembrane space. And they're going to be pumped out against their concentration gradient. And that's super important because those hydrogen ions do not want to go. They don't want to be in that inner membrane space. They actually want to be inside the matrix. They want to be in an area where they're, they're kind of like at a one-to-one -one with electrons. When we pump them out into the inner membrane space, we're not pumping out electrons. So it's a super positive environment. And they're super negative Nancy's, right? Like they don't want to be in a, as positive of an environment as that possibly is. As you, as NADH comes and drops off an electron and a hydrogen at the first pump, it's going to send that electron kind of like down the membrane and across these other pumps. As it hits each different pump, it's going to throw out another another hydrogen ion. So it's going to be charged enough, that electron is going to be charged enough, that it's going to provide enough energy to pump another hydrogen out at each one of those three pumps where you see this arrow going through, arrow going through, arrow going through. Those are going to be your three pumps. So each one of these is going to represent a hydrogen ion getting pumped out. If you notice, NADH is dropping off earlier than FADH. And that's truthfully, that's why we get more ATP per net unit of NADH than we do per net unit of FADH because it doesn't have as much time to pump out as many hydrogen ions to create as much ATP. So what's going on is this electron is moving down these pumps, moving down the membrane. As it moves down, it kind of loses loses energy, if you will. So it's losing the ability to pump out as many hydrogen ions. So FADH doesn't have the ability to pump out as many hydrogen ions, so it's not going to create as much ATP. Um, eventually, sorry, I didn't mean to click those slides over. Um, eventually, we're going to hit this molecule or this, this protein, this transmembrane protein right here that's called ATP synthase. Synthase means it's synthesizing, and ACE, we've already talked about, means it's an enzyme, right? So we're going to move hydrogen ions from high concentration to low concentration, and that's what these brackets mean, is it means concentration of the ion. We're going to move from high to low. As these hydrogen ions come careening down through this, this transmembrane protein, I want you to think about it like there's a turnstile in there, right? So every single time a hydrogen ion comes through, it kind of clicks over that turnstile, and then it clicks over that turnstile, and it clicks over that turnstile, and it clicks over that turnstile, and then we get an ATP. So for every certain number of clicks over of the turnstile, every certain number of hydrogen ions that come through that ATP synthase, we're going to create an ATP molecule, right? So what I want you to see is this is the structure of a mitochondria, right? It kind of looks like a grain of rice with, with some stuff inside. Um, 
what we're actually doing is this membrane right along here is where those hydrogen ion pumps are and this is where the electron transport chain is actually occurring. So it's not like we're pumping hydrogen ions completely out of the mitochondria and then they have to come all the way back in. We're actually pumping them into this little space that lies in between the membranes. So there's an inner membrane and an outer membrane. We're actually pumping them into this space right here, right? Just so you can kind of visualize it. So here is some bullet points. Ooh, that was, that was brutal. Sorry. There, here's some bullet points that are going to be really essentially describing what's going on in the electron transport chain. These three pumps are going to be used to force hydrogen ions out. That first pump is where NADH drops off its electrons. The second pump is where FADH drops off its electrons. The pump is going to be strong enough to pump out, like essentially where, where NADH drops off is going to be strong enough to pump out four, uh, four hydrogen ions. The second pump is going to be strong enough to pump out four hydrogen ions. So that means that NADH has dropped off at the first pump and gotten four hydrogen ions out. It's been able to have its electron travel down to the second pump, which means it's pumped out another four hydrogen ions, which means the NADH has pumped out eight hydrogen ions. The FADH was dropped off at pump number two has only dropped off or only pumped out four hydrogen ions, right? It's important to remember. The third pump, because the, the power of the electron has decreased quite a bit, it's only able to pump out two hydrogen ions. So that means it's two for NADH and it's two for FADH. So at the end, you will have had eight plus two hydrogen ions, so 10 hydrogen ions get pumped out per NADH molecule. And then per FADH molecule, you've had four at the first pump and two at the second pump. And what, why that's so important is because that turnstile goes on orders of four clicks. ATP synthase, for every ATP that it creates requires four hydrogen to come through. So that means every time a fourth carbon click or a fourth hydrogen clicks over that uh, turnstile, we get an ATP. If NADH gets 10 hydrogen ions, that means we get two and a half complete rotations of that turnstile. So we make two and a half ATP, essentially. FADH only gets six hydrogen ions out from the second pump and from the third pump, right? four and then two. So that means we get one and a half clicks over of the ATP synthase. So we only get one and a half ATP. Makes sense. This is just a figure exactly like the first one that I showed you guys, but it's just adding in the pump names and counting the hydrogen so you can see where they're coming from. Okay. Why is this called aerobic? Why is this oxidative phosphorylation? Parker, Dr. Hyde, we haven't even talked about oxygen once. What the heck is going on? Well, this is actually the step that requires oxygen. And if you look closely at this figure, you can see that there is an O2 molecule right here, right? So right next to the third pump is where oxygen is going to come in. And oxygen is what's considered the final electron acceptor. So it's actually, it's like the foster parent, if you will. It's, it's the adoptive parent. It's going to collect these, uh, these electrons that have moved down and are kind of clogging up this third pump, it's going to come and collect them and add them to two of the hydrogens that have come through ATP synthase to create water. So you're actually going to create water at the end of ATP synthase. So what that oxygen molecule is doing is scavenging these electrons and grabbing these electrons to keep pump number three working because otherwise it would become too negative and would not function right. Does that make sense? So oxygen comes into play on the third pump and collects and scavenges the, the those like spare electrons that are kind of just hanging out causing issues. Um, if we do not have oxygen, we cannot scavenge those electrons. So we cannot actually make any more ATP because we would stop these pump systems from working and we wouldn't be able to get the turnstile of ATP synthase working. So we wouldn't be making ATP. So we've made a ton of ATP, but it's super, super slow, right? Because if you think about it, 
you have to go through all of these stair steps of equations. You have to go through all of these coupled reactions in order to get there and all to basically just plug an oxygen on to the end to collect an electron at the very end. So if you remember, I said that at the beginning, a lot of the important nature of learning the biochem and learning the bioenergetics is, is tracking carbons. Well, when it comes to generation of ATP, really what we're doing is we're tracking electrons. We're making sure that we're following electrons through oxidative phosphorylation to make sure that we know how much energy we're going to be producing. And the reason that's so slow is because there's so many steps that have to occur. We have to basically, in order to start getting this, this high amount of ATP at the end, the final terminus point of oxidative phosphorylation, we have to go through all of glycolysis because we have to start generating uh, pyruvate and NADH and ATP. We then have to feed that pyruvate into Krebs cycle, create acetyl-CoA, get an NADH, and then crank that pyruvate, or that essentially those two pyruvates into two acetyl-CoA, crank Krebs cycle twice to create all that NADH. Then we have to shift all that NADH and FADH over into the mitochondria where it goes through the electron transport chain, where the only thing that's happening there is essentially we're, we're using Amazon to drop off electrons and hydrogens that we created in glycolysis and we created in Krebs cycle, right? Um, I, I, I loosely talked about this, but if you want, you can read through this again. Essentially, the, the major difference that occurs between fat metabolism or, or generating energy from fats versus carbohydrates is fats bypass all of glycolysis. So we don't actually have to take um, fats through glycolysis. We take them through a separate process called beta oxidation. So this, this kind of figure actually chains up even more. So you would have the full glycolytic pathway running on one side and you have a full beta oxidation of fatty acid chains running um, just north of where it says from fats. And then kind of where does protein come into play? Really, it, the goal is that it doesn't, right? We want to be in a fed state. We want to make sure that we're in a positive nutrition status, which you'll learn more about in Nutrition for Performance. Uh, but the goal is to actually not break down and degrade protein too much. It's going to contribute somewhat to energy metabolism. And you've probably smelled it before, as weird as that sounds. Whenever we're burning protein, you actually get like an ammonia smell because of that amine or that, that nitrogen group that's present within the protein. So whenever we burn it, you kind of get like an ammonia smell. Um, so if you've ever like been sweating really bad when it's so hot and humid like it gets here in Georgia... Uh, that, that your clothes almost smell ammonia -y at the end of a workout. It's, it's actually high levels of protein that have been broken down. Um, we can feed certain types of amino acids into this like glucose generation. So we can actually take and convert protein into glucose. But really the, the major important thing is that protein can get plugged into Krebs cycle as some of those intermediates. So remember I said that isocitrate dehydrogenase is responsible for serving as a rate limiting enzyme. It kind of senses and makes sure that we have enough, um, enough enzyme, we have enough intermediates to make sure that we can click through Krebs cycle. Protein can actually be used to get fed in to create some of those intermediates so that in, in periods of low energy availability, we can actually use protein to continue to click Krebs over to make ATP. How's it all controlled? Um, we go over this in the longer video, but in general, if we want to create energy, then we need to be in a low energy state. Our body needs to sense that it is low energy and that will stimulate the creation of more energy. If our body is already in a high energy state, it's kind of sitting around like, yo, why do I need more energy right now, right? Like it, it doesn't need it, so it's not going to make it. It's going to be efficient. However, if we're in a low energy state, such as exercise, such as prolonged fasting, such as um, starvation, you're out on the show alone, um, it's, that's when you're going to be trying to stimulate some of this energy generation. And, and really kind of that's when those, those rate limiting enzymes, such as cytochrome C oxidase or uh, isocitrate dehydrogenase or phosphofructokinase are going to be stimulated to click those pathways over faster and faster and faster and faster. So 
really they're stimulated by energy status, if you will. ADP means that we've burned up some ATP, so we need to create more ATP. AMP is the same way, like we've already burned through ATP, we've already burned through ADP, so clearly we're in a high, high energy status, and then, or a high energy need status. And then some of the inhibitors of the pathway are going to be ATP because it's basically showing, yo, listen, I don't need no more energy. I've already got it. We're good. We're good, man. Chill, right? So hopefully those shorter videos helped a little bit. Um, I realize that some of the shorter videos ended up being a little bit longer too. But I want you guys to understand that this is super important stuff. This is the type of stuff that you really need to understand. You really need to know the insides and outs. You're going to hate me while you're studying it. But I promise you, in a year's time or whatever, whenever you're taking nutrition for sports performance or you're taking these later classes, you will, sitting, you will be sitting there thanking me that I made you learn it all this in-depth now.